Okay, so we will investigate two uh, kinds of chemical bonding uh, in this course. The first one called ionic and the second one uh, covalent or molecular uh, bond, <clears throat> molecular compounds. Uh, we already saw ionic compounds. Ionic compounds uh, always exist when there is one element losing electron and the other one gaining electrons. So let's do here a quick recap. So let's start uh, with sodium and chlorine. Okay, let's switch screens. Is everyone all right? Okay. So, for this chapter of chemical bond, I need you to know from the top of your head the number of valence electrons all the time. Okay, so let's start with sodium. Sodium is right here. So, look at the number of the group, and that will tell you the number of electrons in the valence shell. So therefore, sodium, group one, oops, group one, which means one electron in the valence shell. Okay, so we know that only one electron in the valence shell is not a um, stable electron configuration we have to have eight electrons in the valence shell. Two ways to achieve eight electrons in the valence shell. Okay, The first one is to adding seven electrons. Therefore, we will achieve eight electrons in the shell number three. And that is exactly the configuration of argon right here. So that's one possibility. The second one is losing one electron. When one electron is lost, we will not have anything in here. And the valence shell becomes the shell number two. And here we have eight electrons in this shell, which is the configuration of neon. Okay. Therefore, sodium has to decide which way will be easier to achieve stability, to achieve eight electrons in the valence shell. It's very unlikely to gain seven electrons. Therefore, the easiest way for sodium to achieve stability is to lose one electron. When sodium loses one electron, it becomes one plus. Therefore, sodium plus is a stable electron configuration for this element. And sodium will look for a partner to combine to achieve stability okay and for sodium stability means we need to lose one electron to achieve the configuration of neon now let's take a look at chlorine which is on the opposite side of the periodic table chlorine is right here i didn't pick a good color 
change this. Chlorine is right here on the group 17 in row number three. Looking at the group number, we must be able to determine the number of uh, valence electrons. For the group 13 all the way to 18, remember that we have to subtract 10 electrons from the d orbitals. Therefore, chlorine has seven electrons in the valence shell. Okay. Seven electrons is not a stable electron configuration. Remember that we have to have eight, okay? the noble gas configuration. Seven is not there, but it's really, really close. Looking at the electron distribution of chlorine, we see here the seven electrons in the uh, third shell. Stability is going to be achieved by either gaining one electron, and then we get the configuration of argon, which is stable because it has eight electrons in the valence shell. Or there is another possibility. We can lose all the seven electrons in the valence shell, and then the shell number two becomes the valence, because this is going to be excluded, and we achieve the configuration of a uh, neon, which is a noble gas and has eight electrons in the valence shell as well. So now chlorine has to decide what is the easiest way to achieve eight electrons in the valence shell. It's very unlikely to lose seven electrons. It's much more likely to gain one electron. And that's what chlorine needs to do. Chlorine needs to gain one electron. Every time we add electrons, we have a ion. And in this case is a negatively charged ion, which receives the name of an ion. Therefore, chlorine will achieve stability when gain gains one electron and becomes chlorine minus. So chlorine has to find a partner that wants to lose electrons. Therefore, sodium and chlorine, they have uh, the perfect combination. One of them wants to lose electrons, while the other one wants to gain electrons. Sodium and chlorine will combine to form an ionic compound called sodium chloride. Remember that the charges need to be crossed all the times. When we have one, we don't need to represent that. Therefore, the formula is going to be NaCl. And this is an example of ionic bonding because there is one element losing electrons and the other one gaining electrons.
Okay. Uh, so there is a slightly different way to write electron configurations, and that's using uh, what's called the Nobel gas core. Okay. So let's see uh, sodium here. If we look at the electron configuration of sodium, we see that uh, there is a very similar uh, part of the configuration that's exactly the same as neon which is the 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Therefore, we can write the electron configuration of sodium using uh, the Nobel gas score, and that's represented by uh, neon. In this case, in between brackets, and then outside of the brackets, we put whatever is different, which is 3s1. So that's another way to write the electron configuration of uh, elements. So we always going to move uh, using uh, the Nobel gas core, which is usually the Nobel gas right uh, before the element, and then write whatever is different. We can do the same thing uh, for chlorine. So here we have uh, the neon core. So chlorine is going to be uh, neon, 3s2, 3p5. <clears throat> and then you can clearly see here that when sodium loses the 3s1 electron becoming sodium plus, that's going to be exactly the neon electron configuration. And for chlorine, when chlorine gains one electron, that will become exactly the argon electron configuration. And we can just write like that, okay? So that's a very simplified uh, way to write electron configurations. Uh, attention here, elements from the groups one and two and part of the uh, group 13 and 14, they usually will lose electrons to fill the octet and become therefore uh, positive charged ions that are named cations. While on the other side of the table, part of the group 13, 15, 16, and the whole group 17 will uh, gain electrons uh, to complete, uh, to fill the octet, becoming uh, negatively charged uh, ions, named anions. And every time we combine an element that loses electron, electrons, and an element that gains electrons, we have what's called ionic bonding. Okay, so let's see what are the characteristics of ionic compounds. Ionic compounds use, always involves a cation and an anion. Compounds are usually crystalline. Because we have a plus uh, charged and a minus charged uh, ion, we have strong electrostatic interactions between uh, the ions. Interaction between plus and minus is the strongest one possible, which means it's really hard to break this bond, resulting in high melting point and high boiling point. Ionic bonding is usually formed between elements from group 1, 2, or 13, 
which are cations, and elements from group 15, 16, or 17, which are anions. And that's the structure that is going to be formed when we have a solid. <clears throat> See here that we have a small ion, and that's the cation because it lost one electron, therefore shrinks, bonded to a large ion, which is the anion. It's big because it gained one electron, therefore the radius increased. And this is alternated along the uh, three dimensions in the space, and that will form a uh, crystal. And that's the structure of sodium chloride, which is uh, similar to other ionic compounds. And uh, another characteristic of uh, ionic compounds is uh, brittleness. Um, you would think that because the interaction between a cation and an ion is so strong, this compound would be very uh, rigid, very hard. Therefore, uh, however, if we uh, pressure the top of an ionic crystal, we can make it break in a perfect uh, direction and that's called uh, brittleness. So let's see why it's so easy to break apart with using pressure an ionic solid. Okay, so let's see here a um, general example of an ionic solid. Remembering here, the small ion is the cation and the uh, big one is the anion. And the structure will be alternated plus minus plus minus in all the three directions. So if we apply uh, not don't need to apply a large pressure on top of the crystal, this crystal will easily uh, break apart. Why does that happen? So what you will have here, when you apply pressure on the top, the whole top layer will shift down. So this part here on the top will shift one row down. With that, now we have negative facing negative and positive facing positive, which means repulsion. And the result of the repulsion is the uh, crystal breaking apart. And that's why uh, ionic solids are very, very brittle because applying a pressure here will result in uh, electrostatic repulsion and then the crystal will break apart and that's a technique to break very large uh, blocks of sodium chloride for example so a small pressure on the top will make a perfect crack and easily uh, break apart the solid 
Okay. So before we move on to uh, covalent bonding, uh, let's do here an exercise. Okay. What's the most likely charge of the following elements? Potassium, bromine, oxygen, magnesium, and sodium. Remember that the mostly, most likely charge will be formed to achieve electron configuration. In other words, we need to lose or gain electrons to achieve the Nobel gas configuration, to fill the octet rule. So let's give you a couple of minutes. And I would like to add an additional uh, question here. What's the formula of the compounds formed between potassium and bromine and magnesium and bromine? Okay. Let's think for a couple minutes. Try to do by yourself and then uh, we will uh, do it together. Okay, so let's uh, see the most likely charge for the following elements. Potassium, atomic number 19. Bromine, atomic number 35. Oxygen, atomic number 8. Magnesium, 12 and nitrogen atomic number seven. When we are looking for the most likely charge uh, formed, we don't need to know the whole electron configuration. We just need to have a knowledge of the valence electrons. So go find a periodic table and let's locate all these elements in the periodic table and let's see the number of the group. The number of the group is directly correlated uh, with the number of valence electrons. <clears throat> so let me go back here. So we have here potassium, which is in the group one. Oh, sorry. Go to 
the other screen. So potassium right here in the group one. So group one, which means one electron in the valence shell. <clears throat> Bromine is all the way here in the group 17. Bromine belongs to the group 17. For the groups 13 to 18, you have to subtract 10, 10 electrons from the d orbitals. Therefore, we have seven electrons in the valence shell. <clears throat> Oxygen right here on the top of the group 16. Again, group 16, subtracting 10 electrons from the d orbitals, we have six electrons in the valence shell. Magnesium belongs to the group number two. So let's go back up here, right next to sodium. Group number two, two electrons in the valence shell. And finally, nitrogen, going back to the table, right here next to oxygen on top of the group 15. <clears throat> group 15. For the group 15, you need to subtract 10 electrons from the d orbitals, therefore, five electrons in the valence. To achieve stability, we need to lose or gain electrons to get to the octet. Okay. What do we need to do to get to the octet for each of those elements? For the potassium, again, we need to either gain seven electrons or lose one. Losing one is easier. When the element loses electron, it will become positive. Because it was just one electron lost is one plus. For the bromine, we have seven, it's so close to eight that gaining one electron will be easier. When bromine gains one electron, it becomes negative because it was only one electron gained, one minus. Oxygen, six electrons to get to eight, we need to add two more. Therefore, oxygen gains two electrons and becomes O2 minus, okay? Two because two electrons were gained and that yields a two minus charge. Magnesium, two electrons in the valence, it's very easy to lose two electrons, therefore magnesium loses two electrons and becomes magnesium two plus, okay? Plus because electrons were lost, two because two electrons were lost. And for the nitrogen, five to get to eight, we can uh, gain three electrons and that becomes nitrogen three minus. Therefore, the most likely charge for the elements to achieve stability is one plus, one minus, two minus, two plus, and three minus. Therefore, the correct is a D. 
and I added an extra question here. And I want to know what's the formula of the compounds formed between potassium and bromine and magnesium and bromine. Okay, so potassium and bromine, they will combine and actually make the perfect combination because one wants to lose electrons and the other one wants to gain electrons. Therefore, the trick here is to write potassium and the most likely charge, one plus, next to bromine and the most likely charge, which is one minus, you always have to cross the charges. If it is one and one, nothing needs to be done. And the formula of the compound is going to be KBr, potassium bromide. And that's an example of an ionic compound because one element lost and the other one gained electrons. Potassium needs to lose one and bromine really wants to gain one electron perfect combination. Now, the formula of the compound formed between magnesium and bromine. The same thing, write magnesium and the most likely charge is two plus, next to bromine and the most likely charge, which is one minus. Now think with me, magnesium wants to lose two electrons, but each bromine can only gain one electron. Therefore, how many bromines do you need for each magnesium? And that is why you do the crossing of the charges. So the two plus, the two will go here, and the one will go there, okay? Every time you have one, you don't need to put the number there, but anything different from that, you must add it. Therefore, the formula for the compound is MgBr2, which is called magnesium bromide. And the two is there because we need two atoms of bromine to get the two electrons that are being donated uh, from magnesium. Remember, always when you have an element losing electrons plus an element gaining electrons, that's going to be an ionic compound and the kind of bond formed is called ionic bond. Okay, so a quick recap here about uh, ionic bonding. Um, go back to your notes, let's uh, recap. You need to know what's the charge. Remember the charge will be uh, based on uh, filling the octet. Only exceptions are hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium. For them, we follow the duet rule, which is only two electrons in the valence. 
and then when you combine a plus and minus we have an ionic compound and you need to know how to write the formula and how to name uh, the compounds <clears throat> okay so gaining and losing electrons is one way to achieve stability forming ionic bonds and ionic compounds however that's not the only way to go about it we know that hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen are compounds that are stable and hydrogen oxygen and nitrogen they have formula h2o2 and n2 how is that possible to bond hydrogen with hydrogen oxygen with oxygen and nitrogen and nitrogen when in all the cases they need to get electrons to achieve stability this kind of bond when two elements that need to get electrons to be stable is called covalent bonding okay in the case of the covalent bonding we are going to combine elements that need electrons so i think that's a good point to stop for today and on thursday we will uh, talk about the covalent compounds lewis structures and probably the expansion of the octet as well okay so i hope you have a good day and i will see a part of you this afternoon part of you uh, tomorrow morning and all of you on thursday okay have a good day